So I watched the two opening episodes of Just Like That season two. And I really don't know where to start this review. I guess it depends on whether you guys want the good news or the bad news first. Well, the good news is that this show is no longer a grim woke fest. On the contrary, it is finally exactly what we always wanted, which is frivolous yet comforting escapism. The storylines are very unserious, the fashion is so over the top, especially in the first episode, but... The bad news is that the fundamental problem of season one, which was having way too many characters and not enough space nor time for their respective plot lines, is still unresolved. Or should I say, it actually got worse? And also, underneath all that glitz and glamour, there isn't that much substance actually, which made those two initial episodes oftentimes quite boring. So, in this video, I will walk you through my main thoughts and observations on those first two episodes, which means there will be spoilers for the show and occasionally for the entire SATC universe. And just to remind you where we are in the story, since season two picks up roughly three weeks after season one ended, Miranda gave up her corporate lifestyle so that she could move to LA with Che. Charlotte became a woman at the unripe age of 55. Carrie committed a misdemeanor by scattering ashes in the sun and supposedly met Samantha for drinks. Oh, and she kissed her podcast producer, Franklin. Episode 1 centers around the ladies attending the Met Gala and it opens with a very interesting spin-off on a classic getting ready montage, but instead of going out, Carrie, LTW, Charlotte, Seema, Naya, Miranda and Che are getting ready to have some Netflix and chill, literally. And if you're like, um, wait, wait a minute. Why are we talking about the new characters too? Well, in case you didn't know, and just like that, season 2 has now 7 main characters. Thus, Sima, Che, Naya and Lisa got promoted to the main squad, which certainly has its pros and cons. But back to this scene, it felt like a direct response to the criticism of the previous season, which, as we know, portrayed middle age as an awkward, boring and sexless existence. But now everyone is getting lucky, except for Naya, as she's the only one who actually watches a steamy film on Netflix. Alone. <laughs> Of course, we don't know if this will be the only sex scene in this show, as um, I guess a spoiler. No one is having an adult nap time in episode 2. Still, for me, that's a massive improvement from that one awkward scene of Miranda and Che in Carrie's kitchen. And speaking about improvements and Che, wow, their character finally feels like a complex person rather than a sad caricature of a polyamorous non-binary stand-up comedian who uses that dreaded woke moment button and tells lame jokes. And while, well, their humor is still as dry as a desert, their character was given so much more substance and complexity. There is such a moving scene where Miranda wants to cuddle with Che, but they are rejecting her, thus Miranda confronts them. She says, look, I, I've noticed something is wrong with you. You don't want me to touch you, what's happening? And I got a sense that this scene implies that Che might be unfaithful, they might be seeing someone else, but then it turned out that they are just struggling with their body image, as some TV production people made mean comments about their body, and so Che is now on a diet, and they're generally not feeling that sexy and hot. Like, what a beautiful and vulnerable moment. Guys, say what you want, but Miranda and Che really do have a deep bond and great chemistry. Also, Miranda has got a whole makeover this season. We no longer see those hideous plastic wigs. Her outfits are just slaying the boots down. And I love that for her. Conversely, the lack of Carrie's voiceover is 
still very disappointing. At the end of season one, she created her own relationship advice podcast called Sex and the City. Personally, I hoped that the podcast would be turned into her iconic voiceovers, but alas no. Plus, the recording studio still gives radio station vibes, but okay. Carrie is now in a situationship with her podcast producer Franklin, who loves to watch shows about cooking meat, because he's a real man and real men eat meat. Can you tell I'm vegan? Sima became even more sassy than previously. Mainly in this episode, she really felt like a Samantha stand-in. All those years I presented those chic bitches just posing on those stairs. Sima is still seeing Tony from Prada, who apparently lives with his ex-wife. Meanwhile, Naya had a very classic Sex and the City moment when she sat alone in the restaurant and this unknown hot guy approached her. But alas, Naya is still married even though the things aren't looking good for her and Andre. And Charlotte, Charlotte, as always, was given breadcrumbs of storylines. Are we surprised? Not really. Okay, let's talk about the Met Gala costumes, or should I say the Met Ball costumes, as this is how everyone keeps calling this event. So LTW wore a custom Valentino gown, which was made specifically for the show. Charlotte's equestrian slash dominatrix outfit was created by the And Just Like That costume department designers, except for that archival John Galliano hat. Sima was dressed head to toe by Belma, and Carrie, well, Carrie repurposed her pain. After Jackie's wife Smoke, who's a young designer, couldn't finish Carrie's med ball outfit on time, Carrie decided to just pull something out of her closet because, you know, she's Carrie Bradshaw, duh. Which ended up being her custom Vivian Westwood wedding gown from the first SATC film. Now then, the moment she appeared in the stunning gown and Hong Kong Garden by Susie and the Banshees started to play in the background, I just gasped. I automatically knew what they were doing here, meaning this scene, this outfit is a direct reference to the masked ball scene from Sofia Coppola's Marie Antoinette. The same song played in that scene, Vivian Westwood has always been associated with the punk movement, hence the post-punk band. She often drew inspiration from 18th century fashion and of course Marie Antoinette herself. Carrie is about to attend the modern equivalent of a masked ball, like it all ties together and it makes the most perfect episode ending at least for me. On the whole, I quite enjoyed this first episode, as crazy as it sounds, I actually see myself rewatching it, like hardcore PMSing, eating bars of chocolate, and just enjoying this beautiful clothes. It's a pure feast for the eyes. I truly appreciate it also that from the get-go this episode tried to address and therefore correct some season one mistakes like the lack of sex scenes, Che insufferable personality and the overall misjudgment and tone. So yeah, six stars out of ten. Episode two is when it all goes downhill. We start with the bang, meaning the prudish Carrie is back. I know, yuppie. As a self-proclaimed sex anthropologist, Carrie Bradshaw was always pretty private about her sexuality, even during the iconic brunches with her besties. She usually shared quite vague details of her sex life. When big colors, he rarely stays inside the mind. This is why it was so hard for her to become more sex positive and give out more graphic details on that podcast hosted by Che in season one. We also remember Carrie being extremely judgmental of Samantha, being shocked by Miranda's nipples when Miranda was breastfeeding Brady or being absolutely repulsed by the politician's king. So long story short, Carrie was and will probably always be a true prude. Therefore, I wasn't surprised at all when it turned out that 50-something-year-old Carrie is now uncomfortable with reading an ad for a vaginal wellness product. The question is, did we really have to see it? Couldn't the writers choose a better 
Carrie quirk, especially since her hating the icky language and thinking it's so inappropriate for her to read this ad, makes her only plotline for this episode. Like, seriously, it starts with this opening scene with Franklin, and then another podcast producer, Chloe, tries to persuade her. In the next scene, Carrie meets Seema for drinks and she tells her all about her struggles. Then Franklin offers to help in rewriting the ad. Like, this goes on and on forever. Meanwhile, Charlotte's story is about her obsessing over an old Chanel dress she gifted Lily years ago, which now has been sold online by her daughter. I feel like at the end of almost every and just like that episode, Charlotte learns another valuable life lesson and this episode is no exception. Charlotte realizes it's not about the dress, actually. She's just worrying Lily is rejecting everything she has ever gifted her, but then again, maybe it's a good thing as her little daughter is growing and changing and oh my god, how boring. Can someone please give this girl a storyline that doesn't revolve around her being a mother or a wife? Or her playing tennis? Anyone? What about Miranda? You might ask, did she get a better plotline this episode? Uh, well, um, she lost her iPhone? on the beach? Oh, and for a split second, old school Miranda Hobbs was back. Unfortunately, that didn't last long. And Miranda learned that Che is married to Eddie from Dawson's Creek, who now is a bartender. Wow, just like Steve, who hasn't been even mentioned in any of those episodes, by the way. But do you know what's the best part of this grand reveal? Che is married? It leads to absolutely nowhere. Che explains that out of laziness they never got a divorce and you know it's not a big deal. To which Miranda, who might I remind you is a lawyer, had absolutely no pieces of advice for them. Not a single phone number to a divorce lawyer who could owe her a favor, nothing. And do you know why the story went nowhere? because there was simply no time for it, as apparently we desperately needed an update on Sima's rocky relationship with Tony from Prada. Sorry, I, I couldn't care less to learn his name. We also learned about another very important and long-lasting relationship in Sima's life with her hairstylist. We got a confirmation that Naya's marriage with Andre is definitely ending, which I predicted. We also needed to hear Tony Danza's pitch for Chase program. <sighs> The only plotline I actually enjoyed in this episode was about the Wexleys and them dealing with racial discrimination. Also, Lisa's mother-in-law is even more hellish than Bunny McDougall, and I am obsessed with her. I don't know what it is about me, but I just love characters of passive-aggressive mother-in-laws. I would give this episode three stars out of 10, one star for the JW Anderson pigeon clutch, one star for the old school Miranda, and one star for Lisa's hellish mother-in-law. It is truly astonishing how different those two episodes are, and I am very curious to see in which direction the show goes next week. So that's it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate all the love and support from you guys, but now I'd like to hear your thoughts on those two episodes. What were the highlights for you? Did you enjoy the outfits? What will be your ranking? And also, does any one of you watch Glamorous on Netflix? In case you haven't heard about it yet, it's a Netflix show starring the one and only Kim Cattrall that premiered on the same day and just like that season two did, which I find so petty and I love it. So let me know if it's any good and I'll see you next week, okay? Bye.